So my name is uh, John Eckhart, and welcome to the 2017 Wisconsin Entrepreneurship Showcase. Tonight we have an opportunity to learn from some amazing entrepreneurs for Wisconsin's finest. Every single one of them, at some point in their life, had to stop and make a bet on themselves in a very scary moment. And what they made a bet to do is not only bet on themselves to create a company when maybe nobody else would, would, uh, would believe in them, but they also at the same time were making a bet that they could come up with, another, with a new product or service that could help improve the society that we live in. Tonight, the four people that we're gonna hear from uh, are as follows. Zach Helmstead, whose students, whose student startup at UW-Claire has grown to be something absolutely phenomenally large and amazing. Al Kubicek, Alex Kubicek, who is building a weather measurement company here in Madison, which is absolutely incredible. Kristen Berman, who's using behavioral science to work on her startup and her endeavors. And Brian Wiegand, who's been here in Madison, Wisconsin, quietly building and selling startup companies over the last 20 years, including selling one to Microsoft. I've asked each of the speakers to come on stage and boil down their careers into only 14 minutes each. That's all they get. They're gonna tell us their story and share with us some insights from their careers. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Zach Helmstead, to the stage. Thank you, thank you, John. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, as John said, my name is Zach Holmstead. Uh, I'm actually a music major from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Uh, I founded a company named Jamp while I was in school there. Uh, I founded it in uh, like my fifth senior year. And uh, today we employ over 700 people around the world. So I'm gonna take a, a little bit of time uh, tonight to kind of tell you guys my story, uh, all the different things that I went through as an entrepreneur, uh, and also try and answer some of the questions that I most frequently get asked. Uh, my path actually started uh, my sophomore year of college when the blimpies that I worked at shut down and I needed to find a job. Uh, I went around the city of Eau Claire and I put in my resume which had nothing on it other than my name and, and phone number at that point. Uh, I brought it to every computer place in town. So if they were doing web design or computer repair, I dropped my resume off and after about a month of that, I didn't get a single call back. Uh, Walking through the campus at UWEC, uh, actually stumbled across a job posting for the IT department. It was called CNS, and it was doing Mac management uh, for faculty computers on campus. Uh, got the interview, was able to answer the one technical question for the job correctly, uh, and got the job. And had an incredible experience as a student employee uh, on that campus. I can't stress how much I was able to learn working in that, it was like I was working in the real world, but as a student I had all these responsibilities that I don't think someone my age would have gotten uh, outside of, of the university. It was such a great environment for me to learn in. And uh, two years later when my boss moved on to another job inside uh, our organization, I actually got his job. And so I spent the next four years working full time on campus. And my job was to make sure that all the faculty computers, all the faculty Macs on campus were up and running as best as possible. And my, my boss in that job was absolutely incredible in helping me understand the, the power of technology when it relates to helping humans. And so our job was to get the technology out of the way of humans. So the, the less the technology was actually interfering with people's learning or teaching, the better job that we were doing. Uh, in addition to my music major, I had a computer science minor. And I was able to use that a lot in my job. So managing Macs back in 2002, uh, there weren't a lot of tools for it. And my, my coworkers on the Windows side had all these incredible tools that made their job really easy. They like never had to leave their desk and I had to walk to every part of campus anytime something went wrong. And using my computer science minor, um, which was fairly minimal skill set that I, that I had for that, uh, I was actually able to start building some tools to help make my job easier. And about two years into my job, I decided, all right, I don't want to build these tools just for the university anymore, because I think they're, they're really useful for a lot of people. I know that there's a lot of people that have the same job as me and are struggling with these same problems. Uh, and went and talked to my boss and said, all right, I want to start a company. I still want to work here because uh, I'm completely broke uh, and don't have any money to start a company. Um, but I want to actually go outside and start developing software on my own. 
So in 2002, we founded Jamf. Uh, I was still going to school full time. I was working full time on campus, and basically nights I spent in coffee shops uh, and bars working, and the weekends I would spend the entire weekend uh, working on writing software for Jamf. We actually started that with $1,800. That's how much money we spent in the first year. We bought a computer. Uh, we paid for some web hosting. We uh, bought a piece of software to help us develop. And we filed for our LLC in the state of Wisconsin. $1,800 was our startup cost uh, in that first year. During that time, we got, a, we got a handful of customers to come on. And uh, by 2004, when I finally graduated, after uh, eight years of college, I was able to finally leave my job at UW-Eau Claire and focus full time on Jamf. So I spent an incredible amount of time over the next two and a half years traveling around the world, meeting customers, and every penny that we made at Jamf, we put back into the company. And a lot of that went to travel. We found that we were really successful when we actually got face to face with people, but we really struggled when we were doing things just over the phone. So it was a lot of travel in those days and zero paycheck. So I did a little consulting on the side to, to pay rent and things like that. And after about two and a half years of that, by, by 2007, um, we'd, we'd actually created a board for Jamf. So we went out, we looked at the, the weaknesses that the two or three of us during that time had, and we said, all right, where, what types of areas do we actually need to get outside expertise on? We found a, a guy named Jim who was our chairman of the board for about a decade. He had had tons of experience in different businesses, came on and gave us his incredible life history of, uh, of experience that was incredibly useful to us. Uh, he's one of the best mentors I've ever had. Uh, we found financial advice on our board. We had uh, a CPA come and join our board. And the importance of a solid board was lost on me at that point. Uh, and we were very lucky to build this incredible board. And it's evolved over time, but through that entire time, it's not been people who are just there to say yes to whatever we want to do. They're there to challenge our ideas and make us better. And our board has been a huge part of our success. So as you're looking at starting things, when you get to the spot of looking for a board, finding really good people that fill in your gaps, that don't necessarily see the world the same way that you do, is an incredibly powerful thing. Our board has been the biggest supporter of us over, over time. Um, so about two and a half years after leaving the university, it was 2007, uh, January, we had about 125 customers around the world that were paying us. And uh, that's when we decided that we're actually going to start hiring employees. Uh, people ask me a lot as an entrepreneur, you know, what's the, what's the scariest thing you've ever done? And for me, it was really this time when we started hiring people. And almost everyone that we hired our first two years were friends and family. They were people that we knew. Uh, they were really close friends that were quitting great jobs that they have to come work for us. They were really good friends that were graduating from the university that had a great job lined up. Uh, with international banks and turn those jobs down to come join us. Uh, their parents made sure that I heard about that at their wedding. Uh, but this was really scary, not because uh, they weren't awesome people, and they weren't coming to do great things, but we had to pay them. They had mortgages that they were having for the first time. They were starting families. These people were having their, their first kids in their first houses. and. We tried to protect them from what the bank account looked like, but on the first of every month, it didn't look very good. We made payroll every month. We had a line of credit that we dip into every once in a while. Uh, but this was a really scary time for me. I lost a lot of sleep. And this is where our board was really, really helpful uh, to help us create what we called a, a balanced scorecard. And that meant that we, we tried to be profitable, not because we wanted to get rich off of it, because we wanted to have money in the bank to pay people if we had a bad month. If we had a bad quarter, our first response wasn't to start laying people off, but actually we were able to group together as a team uh, and do that. So that's one of the hardest times that I went through at Jamf, was really this, uh, how do you actually make sure that everyone's getting paid when they're really close friends that are they're leaving in a startup? So one of the things that that's uh, maybe unique for a lot of companies these days is uh, we were a bootstrap company. That means that we didn't take any money from outside. We didn't go and find a bunch of investors to get millions and millions of dollars uh, in the bank before we started doing stuff. We were, at this point, five years in of, of creating products, finding customers, and uh, we still had no outside money. So every penny that we wanted to spend on people, on travel, we had to actually earn uh, to, to be able to, to pay those bills. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, you'll probably have uh, 
you know, talk of angel investors or venture capitalists or private equity firms, there's always different spots that those that come in and are very useful uh, in starting a company. Uh, we didn't have a great experience in the, in the only one uh, venture capitalist that we ever talked to. We walked in and uh, they looked at what we were doing. And when we founded our company in 2002, that was Apple's worst fiscal year since 1982. Uh, it was the absolute wrong time in everyone's eyes to be creating a company that was focused on nothing but Apple. And it was very smart of them to say that's not really a good idea. Uh, and they offered us uh, $1 million for 90% of our company. And we turned that down and said, all right, we think we can, we can do this on our own. So we were heads down for a few more years. And uh, through that time, we just continued to grow. We had this kind of 30 to 40% growth every year. Uh, we were finding that many more customers. Uh, our products were providing that much more value. And we continued to hire people at that same rate. So by 2011, uh, we actually started branching out of Eau Claire, Minneapolis for our offices. Uh, we opened an office in New York. We opened an office in Cupertino, uh, which is where Apple's located out in Silicon Valley. And those offices were good, good for us for a lot of reasons. They're still very small offices today, uh, but we bring a lot of customers into them. We've got huge pockets of customers, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. And for them to be able to come and see our offices and see our people uh, has been a very useful thing for us. Fast forward a couple years further, uh, we opened our first international offices in Amsterdam and Hong Kong in 2013. And 2013 was a, was a big year for us. Uh, that was the first time that we went out and tried to raise capital. So we had made it 11 years before we went to the outside world and said, we're, it's time to raise money. And we weren't doing that because we were running out of money. We were actually cash flowing really well. We were actually putting money in the bank. Um, but we knew that we could do more if we had a little bit more money. It would allow us to be more aggressive with our hiring and our spending. But we had a lot of uh, private equity firms that were coming to us. And private equity firms are a little different than venture firms. Venture capitalists uh, tend to be much more risky in what they invest in, hoping that one of them makes it really big. But, uh, private equity firms tend to invest in existing, growing businesses that have a business plan that's working, uh, that have a lot of years behind them and a track record. And so we had a lot of private equity firms that looked at us and how we were bootstrapped and were impressed with what our company looked like. And so for us, we, th we thought that we were in a very, very lucky spot to know that the money was going to be the easy part of this to, to actually get when we went out to do this raise. But I learned through this process that this is so important. Uh, we had two primary things that we wanted out of our partner that we would come in and, and raise money with. Uh, first was that they had to have access that we didn't into our, into our world. And the, the second was that they had to have insights into what we do that we don't have. We found amazing partners uh, that have come in and joined our board and been incredible advisors. They've helped us so much in growing our organization. And uh, I think when you go out and look for, for capital, if it's with a venture firm or private equity firm or an uh, angel, it's not just about the money you should be looking at. Also look at what else can they do to help you grow. The money is one thing, but the, the amount of things that they can do to help you and your company grow is incredible. Uh, Last thing I'll talk about with Jamf was one of the hardest things that we've ever done uh, was actually hire an external CEO. So my friend Chip and I were co-CEO for a very long time, and we ran over our heads. Company was still doing fine. We were growing. We were profitable. But we knew that we were one day ahead of the organization, and we were learning every single day to stay that one day ahead. We went out, and we found an amazing hire that came in. Uh, his name is Dean. He's been our CEO for about two and a half years now. Uh, has really helped grow our organization over the last few years. Uh, one of the other things that people ask me a lot is, uh, what's a piece of advice that you have for people who want to be uh, entrepreneurs? And kind of the cliche answer to that uh, is, find something that you're passionate about. Uh, and people say that for all realms of life, like when you're going into work, when you're going to school, whatever that is. But it's really actually very important to take that seriously. Uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, one of the big things that you can't do is get burnt out. Uh, you're literally going to spend tens of thousands of hours building and refining whatever your ideas are to get them to market. In my 13 years before we hired Dean, uh, I'm guessing I spent 70 to 80 hour work weeks every single week for 13 years. If I got burnt out, that would have been a really, really bad thing. And without that passion, it's really hard to, uh, to succeed when you're trying to build something new. Uh, with that, I think I'm just about out of time.
in its own right. Thank you all very much. Hey everybody, I'm Alex Kubicek, the co-founder and CEO of Understory, and just because I really love puns, uh, I'm going to tell you the Understory story, the, the best kind of pun that I can come up with uh, for weather. So, um, but first, uh, a couple things about me. I have an undergraduate degree in physics from UW-Whitewater, uh, undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Madison, and a master's in atmospheric science from Madison as well. And um, none of that's actually relevant to my story at all. Uh, so I have a confession to make. I did not come up with my idea. Uh, but I did start it. So uh, in 2011, I was in this course about venture creation. I was in the graduate level, the 734 course. Uh, but one of the assignments was, you are going to pitch to go into Y Combinator. Tell us how you're going to do it. Uh, and I didn't have a company idea or whatever, so I, I wrote about weather. Uh, weather is the thing that I knew the most. Uh, there's an incredible amount of gaps in our weather understanding, and I wanted to find a way to solve it. And so I decided, hey, I'm going to create a company called Weather and Instruments. Winstruments, great name, uh, very clever, I think. Uh, but the idea was we were going to take uh, Wi-Fi enabled weather stations, sell them to people to put in their backyards, and that would allow them to feed data into a social network and sell their data to researchers, government groups, and so on. And I thought this would be a good idea, so I started taking it through the, the venture creation course, but I was, I was greener than green. I, this is my first business class that I've ever taken, and uh, they're talking about company culture one day, so I had to raise my hand and say, hey, what is that? Because um, I had no idea that that was actually really important to starting a company. Uh, but anyways, so I went in head first, and we built this weather station. Wi-Fi enabled, really neat, could go into people's backyard, and as a scientist, I thought, okay, if I build this really neat thing, uh, I would essentially be able to, to sell a ton of them. People will just flock to these weather stations. And so we thought, okay, let's try our hat at a few business plan competitions. Uh, you know, a lot of people would be interested in this and we can probably win them easily. The feedback was brutal. Uh, this will never work. Your use cases don't make any sense. Why would I ever need data better than the weather channel? Uh, and that was tough. This is this really smart person with incredible experience telling me that my idea was, was dumb and wouldn't go anywhere, and they had no idea to see that there was potential in it. Uh, another thing that happened is that we had an article written about us uh, by In Business uh, Magazine, and they said, Alex wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. That won't go anywhere. Uh, but we're a fighter, so they like to uh, talk about us. Uh, so we got a third in one of the competitions, we're a finalist in another, but we didn't even get close to placing in the Wisconsin School of Business competition. And through that, we were able to create a network that allowed us to uh, get into a, a group called Generator, which is an early stage uh, venture uh, group that looks at helping early stage startups find their business model. And so we got into that uh, program, and the first thing they asked us was, did you ever talk to anyone about if they wanted one of these things? And uh, of, course, of course we didn't. Um, so we got a focus group together in Milwaukee and we said, okay, great weather station, you can connect to this amazing social network and see all these really neat things. Uh, would you buy one and put it in your backyard? And not a single person raised their hand. So what we had was something that was a, a nice to have, but what we needed was a must-have. To start a company, you have to have something that people really want and they need. It's solving a certain type of pain, and that's not what we had. So we decided to pivot, uh, which is a, a startup metaphor you know, taken from basketball. You're, you can't dribble anymore. You can't go anywhere. The only thing you can do is create a new opportunity by pivoting, and that's what we did. So we decided to pivot. No more selling to consumers. We're going to sell to business uh, and you know, sell them the data. We're going to own the physical weather stations and create something that uh, everyone would need. So, and we're going to do this systematically this time. We're going to talk to researchers, government groups, utilities, airports, insurance companies, and try to see who needs the data the most. And through that process, we were actually able to find 
a must have, and that was in the insurance industry. We found by talking to insurance executives that they had a huge problem around the fact that they're paying out way more claims than they needed to uh, because you had all these bad acting contractors that were essentially trying to make a quick buck off of people that didn't know better. And what they were lacking was hail data. So we thought, okay, we can add that to our weather station. So this beautiful weather station was our mock-up of what we wanted to build. So it had hail uh, and allow us to deploy the sensor and everywhere and create a really interesting uh, business off of that. And so what we decided to do is we needed $200,000 to build a pilot network. And so we decided to raise that from angels. And for those of you who aren't familiar, angels are individuals that essentially uh, you know, give money to startups to hopefully make a return. And so over the course of the next 12 months, we talked to every single Wisconsin angel that we could. And the feedback, again, was brutal. Uh, it's a neat idea. I don't invest in hardware. Neat story. Come back when you actually have paying customers. I don't think you know as much as you think you do about weather. Come back to me when you have something better or this will never work. Uh, and I really like what you guys are doing, but I don't invest in things this early. And this technology is impossible. You can't display weather data on a map. That one was interesting. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> what I did see is I, I can plot nodes on a map. Uh, so we had about 15 uh, you know, investors tell us this is this dumb, it'll never work. And so we kept trying. And so at this point, the university offered us a, uh, or me an opportunity to actually try to go into a PhD program, a much safer route. Um, but I decided to follow my passion. I had a, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to build something really neat and something that I really cared about. So I kept going and three months later, I, for continuing to get brutal feedback, we found a group called Bolt. And so what Bolt is, is it's a hardware uh, seed investor that goes in and helps companies that have hardware products and help turn them into realities. And that's exactly what we needed. The only thing was, it wasn't in Wisconsin. Uh, it was in the East Coast in Boston. And we thought this, was a great opportunity, so we left Wisconsin to go there because we couldn't find anything. It just didn't exist in the state. And through Bolt, we were able to build a hardware product that we're really proud of, um, and you know we could create this device, this solid state sensor that uh, basically is a ball that can sense wind, rain, hail, temperature, pressure, humidity, everything else, and it has no moving parts, which means no maintenance, perfect for the startup that wants to build its own weather infrastructure. So we had the technology and we were ready to go uh, to the next stage. Uh, and our business plan was holding true. We were gonna sell the data, build the infrastructure, and we signed our first insurance customer uh, in Kansas City, so it was really exciting. So we needed a million dollars to prove the network in multiple cities, and that, aspect needed something called venture capital. And so venture capitalists, they're looking to make 5x or more on their investment over the next five to 10 years. And this is really interesting because with venture capitalists, this moves really fast. So essentially, you are getting married after the first couple dates. Like this is, this is really hard, and they have to really believe in the company. So we went out, made our pitch, and the feedback was brutal. Uh, we don't know weather or insurance. Uh, I have too many questions about the applications, uh, manufacturing, deployment, and execution. That all needs to be worked out. I'm not sure if your balls really work. <laughs> Again, weird, uh, but it's a fair point. Uh, but let's revisit this as you pull together a better business model. And I was just five. Uh, we had 25 extra no's between the different coasts, in the middle of the country, and everywhere. And essentially, um, what we found through that whole the process is, is great investors uh, put people first. So good investors will look at your business model and your, your product and everything you're trying to do, but they'll look for people that can execute, they can adapt, and a lot of investors look for someone that has an unfair market advantage, and that's uh, what we found. And so after we found the first couple investors, everyone wanted to invest us, we were the hottest thing around. So we raised double uh, what we planned to do, $2.1 million from some of the best investors uh, in the world. And we deployed our, our sensors in Kansas City and Dallas. Uh, we created data that no one else had, and we validated pieces of our business model. We were able to see that insurance executives were really excited about what we were doing, but it didn't actually hail when we deployed these networks, so we still didn't have hard proof. Um, so we needed to make a bigger network. So we needed to find $5 million more to build out and prove out our business model. And the thing about this is this is called the Series A. And so the Series A, they can't just invest in just the people. They need to have harder business model proof. And while we had a really great story and some proof, it wasn't as much proof as investors needed to actually put that in. 
And so we had to find someone who was looking to make a really big swing. Uh, and that's hard, that's hard on our employees, our customers, and everyone who is associated with the company because they didn't know if we're gonna be around if, if they were wasting their, their time with us. Um, and so, again, created a pitch, went out, and started pitching people. And do you guys wanna know what the feedback was? <laughs> This is what 100 no's look like. Uh, but through that entire process, we were able to find an investor in Wisconsin called 4490. It's backed by uh, some of the largest financial institutions in Wisconsin, uh, by Wharf uh, and others. And essentially what they found is they found someone who has a Silicon Valley mindset and dropped them into the middle of Wisconsin where there's a ton of opportunities for companies to benefit from that. And that was really exciting. So they led around, we raised 7.5 million uh, based off of that. And a lot allowed us to uh, grow. All of our old investors came in and uh, we were able to uh, get to the next level. And during this whole process, 4490 asked me, hey, have you thought about moving back to Wisconsin? I mean, uh, there's great talent here. Um, it's it's cost-effective office space, living, uh, it ends up being cheaper for everyone, and it's, it's really a no-brainer. And so we thought, okay, we'll move the company back to Wisconsin. And so that was something that was really exciting for us because all that was true and we were able to do some really incredible things. Um, but the, the point I want to make is that throughout, that was about a five-year process to get to where we are today to raise over $10 million. But Every single day at a startup is like a roller coaster. The highs are really high, the lows are really low. Uh, maybe you'll sign a customer, maybe another day uh, an employee leaves, or that happens in the same day. So you're just kind of in this emotional superposition, uh, which, is, which is really tough. And then the other thing that's really important is building a robust network that you would be uh, proud of and be able to, uh, you know, it basically takes a village to build a company. And so if we didn't have the connections that we did at the beginning from the Wisconsin School of Business, we never would have met Generator and we never would have went into Bolt and so on. So it kind of creates the snowball effect uh, by having that network effect. And of course, the other thing you need is, is grit, is perseverance, is the ability to adapt, because everyone's gonna tell you no, everyone's gonna tell you that you're, you're dumb, and it's, it's gonna be, if you are thinking about starting a company, it's gonna be the single most, the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, and every single day makes it harder. Uh, they talk about the learning curve for startups, and it's, it's basically vertical, and it never stops being vertical, and uh, you, know, you have to learn how to adapt, and you know, why I talked about before about that, this wasn't my idea, is because it was crafted by the market and the people that we're talking to our customers and that's how you're able to see, succeed is actually building a company and it was all worth it so we're able to build our weather sensors and deploy them uh, so th this is a picture of them uh, right outside uh, the Capitol but then we also deployed 150 across Dallas uh, 400 across five cities in an island uh, and we created unprecedented weather insights. So we were able to deploy sensors in Denver, Colorado, and on May 8th, they saw the worst hailstorm that the state of Colorado has ever seen, second worst hailstorm in the history of the United States, $1.4 billion in damage to home and auto, and we captured the entire thing. And through that, we had proof that we saved insurance companies 15% on storms loss, and that scales over $4 billion a year. Uh, this incredible business model proof just because we kept pushing and kept going as, as hard as we could. And with that, we're able to begin deployment in 75 cities. So it uh, allows us to scale throughout the, the US, but then we're also finding opportunities uh, internationally where we can, since our sensors are so cost effective, we can deploy them in the middle of Argentina and create understanding about how climate change is impacting people there and understand how they can plan for their next growing season. And so through everything that we had done, that has allowed us to actually get to the point that we are and allows us to continue to grow as a company. And I didn't come up with that idea. Thanks everybody. Hey everyone, apparently I don't have a slide, so my name is Kristen Berman. Well, this, you can visualize that as I talk. Um, so I'm gonna start with something that happened to me actually last month. I was at a conference, a behavioral conference in New York, and I was standing next to this man named Todd Rogers. In the behavioral world, Todd Rogers, he's a big deal. Uh, he's written a lot of things. He has a lab at Harvard, a behavioral science lab, and he was chair of this conference. And so Todd looks at me and says, hi, I'm Todd. I'm like, yes, obviously, I know you're Todd. Um, and I'm like, I'm Kristen, we've met. 
And when somebody looks at you and says, we've met, you usually have this like terrible state, like facial expression that says, I have no idea who this person is. So he does that expression and then he looks at me and he's like, oh, I remember you. He's like, you're the person without the PhD. I was like, whoa. All of my defensive mechanisms just like went really, and I start to get really like, what do you mean? And he's like, no, you're, you're like a hustler. You hustled your way into the field of behavioral science. And I was like, okay, good save. Uh, but I reflected like, yeah, I've hustled my way into the field of behavioral science. So right now I have a lab out of Duke University that is funded $8 million called Common Sense. I have a nonprofit, uh, a rational labs fund with the, one of the top behavioral scientists, economists out there. I've done full day workshops for Facebook, the World Bank, and started the behavioral science group at Google. So I've hustled my way in. Uh, so today I'm kind of going to give you some of the, like, how I'm post-rationalizing how that, some of that hustle uh, helped me get there without this PhD. In Wisconsin, when I was a sophomore, I started a company called NetNerds. So if you know the Geek Squad, I was basically, it was kind of the same. NetNerds is pretty well known on campus, but in the beginning, um, it was just a bunch of people that tried to fix computers for other college kids. So I didn't know how to fix my computer, so I hired some folks, called them nerds, and then they fixed, they fixed the computers of other college kids. Um, and I realized as I had started this really quickly, I was way in over my head. Uh, and so I did, was like, oh, I'm by the business school, I should probably take some classes. But as a sophomore, you actually cannot take any business school classes, at that point at least. And so I emailed the business school and said, can I take, can I get in, I'd really like to, I'm starting this thing. And they were like, did you read the policy? No. Uh, but then I emailed John Eckert back there and asked him, John, I'd really like to take your class. Can I get in? Um, and somehow he pulled some strings magically and I got into his class. Um, and so with that kind of support and over the next three years, this little net nerds thing went from like an Excel sheet to like a matching service. It went from like, you know, uh, kind of move in day fixes to supporting apartment complexes, sorority houses, um, surrounding Madison area. And at one point I had 10 nerds running around uh, town fixing computers for folks. Um, so pretty cool evolution, um, but really if you're in college, one of the things that happens to you is you have to graduate. And so so the question I had to answer was, what do I do with this thing called NetNerds that I've built is now a, a campus name, uh, what should I do? Uh, it's a pretty tough decision process, right? I put a lot of blood, blood sweat, no blood, but in theory, um, some tears, uh, into this company called NetNerds, and I was just gonna have to either continue or leave. Um, and my reflection here is a very, very difficult decision, but my reflection was I actually don't really like IT. I didn't really like fixing computers, hence why I started it was so that I didn't have to fix my own computer. And so with that understanding, I basically said, okay, I'm gonna leave the world of entrepreneurship now, but actually place myself in San Francisco, which is you know the city of entrepreneurship, and I got a job at Intuit. So Intuit is a tax and accounting uh, company. Um, had a really good time at Intuit. I launched one of their first SMS product, products, kind of helped move them in the quicken world from desktop to online. But the most interesting thing about Intuit was what I realized what they weren't doing correct. Um, so at one point I was leading the customer development for QuickBooks Online, which is a accounting software. Uh, we would talk to a lot of accountants and people running their accounting in, in small businesses, and we'd try to figure out what feature to build next. So you do this if you're trying, if you're like in product management, you'd figure, you talk to some customers and then you go and say, okay, this is what we're gonna build. Um, and you step back and you're like, we're talking to five people and we're gonna make a huge business decision based on what five people say? I was like, this is like a large, huge company. What are we doing? This feels crazy and risky. Like there's gotta be a better way. There has to be more information out here than just talking to five humans. Um, so I remember when I saw Dan Ariely speak and I was like, oh, this is the answer. So Dan Ariely, he's a famed economist. Um, at that point, he'd written Predictably Rational. He's now gone on to write three other New York Times bestsellers, Google Behavioral Economics. His name comes up. Um, and I just fell in love. I like totally fell in love with this field. I was like, this is amazing. Here's the science I've been looking for. But like, what do I do? I'm at, into it. He's an academic. I, like, what should I, I'm kind of stuck here. And so I did what I did with John, which is my one move, which I just emailed Dan and said, hey, I want to help you. What can I do? 
And like, I literally remember where I was sitting when like three hours later, the man emails me back and was like, hey, let's talk on the phone. I was like, this floored of like, I cannot believe this is happening. So Dan and I talked on the phone and we devised and schemed a plan that I would basically leave Intuit for three months, but work on Intuit problems at Duke, take some of his classes, learn behavioral science. This was like genius. You know, I was gonna still stay at the company and apply behavioral science. Wonderful. If you go to a corporation, um, you will, Understand when I say it's all it's a very nice idea, but actually getting an idea off the ground at a large company is difficult. So even though I had the founder's approval, getting it through middle management was not possible. So basically the net thing from Intuit was like, no, we don't want you to go do this. So I was devastated. Here I had this kind of dream vision, not able to execute on it, and I had a few decisions to make. So I realized I like behavioral science, wonderful. Do I go get a PhD? So if you kind of want to build stuff and you want to actually like go out in the world and apply it, probably a PhD isn't for you, but that's really the only way into the world of behavioral science was getting your PhD. Or I could stay into it and try to like push a boulder up a hill and try to push behavioral science into this company. Um, and what I decided to do was actually kind of a third path, which I emailed Dan and said, hey, this whole thing didn't work, but I still want to be involved. Um, and what ended up happening is I got a job as a PM at a startup called Lytro, and on the side, worked with Dan. So on the side, I actually crafted this thing where I would learn from him when he came to San Francisco, he was in Duke, and we would do projects together. And this went on for a few years, and what happened was a few things. One, I learned a lot, so I learned a ton around behavioral science from the master, kind of a mini PhD, if you will. Second thing is we ended up actually launching one of the biggest behavioral conferences um, out there at the time where we brought startups together with world-class behavioral scientists and we kind of brainstormed on how to uh, improve their product and improve customer well-being, nudging people to, to make changes in their products so that people are better off. Uh, and um, a, sec a third thing happened was what I got over the last couple of years, I got like, uh, when I was working at Lytro, very disillusioned. So it was like, ah, oh, I have this great thing going on over here, but Lytro is not that fun anymore. Lytro is the startup that I'd, I'd gone to after Intuit. Um, and I'd started as the first PM, as a growing startup, it was like a camera revolution, you can Google Lytro, it's like focus first or focus after the fact. It was kind of a really cool thing back in the day. Um, and I had come there as a PM, but was moved to marketing after we had already developed the camera. So once you launch hardware, there's not much to do except sit around and wait for it to sell. And so I was going around the world selling the camera. Would go to Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia. Seemed very glorious, but actually was terrible. It was like I was selling somebody else's camera. I didn't really like it. It was not that creative. Um, and so I was just got really, really down around like what I should do. <laughs> And so I, I did then what I had done with John and then Dan the first time is I emailed Dan again and say, hey, this whole thing of us hanging out and working together at Hockley is nice, but what I'd really like to do is figure out something more formal. Um, and kind of with the realization was like, I realize I don't have that PhD, you know, because typically you're an academic, you need a PhD in order to get into the field, but what do you think? And I remember sending that email, I was like, I'm gonna get an email back in like three hours. It's gonna be the same thing. <laughs> no go. So I actually didn't hear from him for a while. And so this whole thing of like, I have no idea what's going on with Dan, my job's not going well, and what happens is my manager emails me and says, hey Kristen, let's go to dinner. I was like, oh, this is actually, there's some upside here. Potentially I could rejigger stuff at Lytro, maybe become a little bit happier, and I could still kind of keep this two track thing going on. Um, before the appetizer came, she fired me. Yeah, and I'm like, whoa, I was a valedictorian in my high school, straight as in college, I don't get fired, like what? And so it was just shocking, I was completely devastated. I think I waited until I left in order to like start crying, but like it was about three days of crying. Uh, really upset, because I had basically nothing going on on the day job and my side job was up in the air as well, or my uh, work with Dan. Uh, about, about three days after that happened, uh, Dan calls me. And he says, Kristen, do you want to work together? I was like, whoa. And I just like shouted like, yes. And I, and I was like, oh, by the way, like doing what? <laughs> it's like unclear. Uh, no, but he said, actually what we're going to be doing is launching the behavioral science group uh, at Google. And you're going to lead it. And so this was, this is what just kind of blew my mind from not having a background in behavioral science to going and working for two years for free for someone and then being able to lead the Google 
uh, efforts with behavioral science. What happened then was just a snowball. So the work we did, we worked with over 26 teams at Google, including the self-driving cars, um, and other companies started approaching us to do work around nudging, uh, nudging folks. So folks like Lyft, we worked with in order to change and increase driver hours. Uh, so to help people drive the hours that they wanted to. We worked with Fidelity to help more people save in their 401ks by nudging them on how the, the message was framed. So we did a lot of work for other companies and this merged into a rational lapse, which Dan and I co-founded together and is a nonprofit to improve people's health and well-being that, through behavioral science. Through that work, then, it morphed into common sense, and common sense basically is taking all the behavioral science work that um, we've done in the field of financial decision making and focusing it on uh, fintech and credit unions. So we'll go into a company like um, Digit. Uh, Digit's a nice little fintech app, and you basically deposit some money, and they'll automatically save for you. Um, and so our team went in and doubled savings rates for tax time, saving people over a million. Uh, we worked with another company to uh, help people pay off debt faster and saved an average of $8,000 for people who were in the experiment. Um, so basically, we've ha I've had this kind of snowball effect from asking people uh, for asking people for what I want. Um, and then reflecting on this, kind of going back to the beginning when it was Todd Rogers stuff, I counted up before this talk how many experiments Todd Rogers Lab has done, field experiments, and we've doubled the amount of experiments that Todd Rogers uh, Harvard Lab has done in the only the last year for common sense. Um, so I think the, the lesson in the reflection for me is basically kind of, I don't, you don't need to get the whole track that someone tells you to, and entrepreneurship is more than just starting another business, it's defining your own path, and sometimes that means asking for what you want. So.